So we're continuing this chapter on the concrete relations with others, and we're going to cover the first section, love language masochism. The overarching point of this second chapter is to describe the failed attempts of the forward self to apprehend its objectness, its being for others. The failure to see ourselves as the other sees us from the outside, in situation. Another aspect of this is a failure to involve our freedom in all the aspects of our being, especially facticity. When we use that word apprehend, um, we're talking about making an object. And as we do this, we're, we're crafting the object in a certain way. We're defining it on our terms. So that's what I mean, that there's a failure to involve our freedom in um, an aspect of our being. It's outside of us. It's, it's made by the transcendence of the other. So these attempts and failures outline a motive behind our pursuit of being. Our attempts to apprehend our being in itself, uh, our attempts to understand the totality of what we are. And this would involve seeing ourselves as continuous with everything. The, the very separation that allows us to distinguish ourselves, our body, our point of view upon the world, requires that initial internal negation that I, that I mentioned in almost every video, that rupture, that uh, that, that rupture that is the introduction of nothingness, of consciousness. And ultimately, this separation alienates us from what we are. So our pursuit of being aims at filling the void that we are, seeing the totality. This pursuit is the underlying motivation behind the three ecstasies, reflection, temporality, and being for others. These ecstasies are attempts to recover our being. They are attempts to look back on ourselves. We have covered the ways in which we fail at these attempts, and as a result of the failure to recover our being through the other, uh, leads us to the project of love, which will also end in failure. Sartre discusses language as well in this chapter, and language as we might imagine is an attempt to access the interiority of the other. And of course, we, we never truly get to see through the other, the eyes of the other, and we never get to uh, look back at ourselves through the other. So this underlying motive helps us understand what love, language, and masochism is ultimately about, and, and why they're considered together in this section. So this estrangement, this wrenching away, as Sartre will often describe it as, is also a pursuit. Sartre writes that I am the project of the recovery of my being. So this is a pursuit of being. The, this pursuit determines the way in which I define the objects before me. Um, this pursuit is oriented by our value towards our, our lack, and we experience this lack as desire. So I just want to uh, remind us you know, what those uh, words mean by bringing them into this context. Now, the other complicates this. The other, like the for itself, like you, is in the same predicament. The other is in pursuit of being as well. And our mutual, mutual capacity to make an object out of the other is a source of conflict. If we remember way back to the chapter covering bad faith, we have the capacity to rewrite the script after the scene is made. You know, we, we could always make excuses. We could frame our situation in our favor. Yet we recognize that the other is not bound by our, our ability to do so. The other is not bound by our freedom. So this is why the, uh, the other represents a kind of threat to our making of the world. The other is transcendent as we are transcendent, and we cannot see through their eyes. We cannot see the way we fit into the continuity of being through their eyes. We cannot see the self that we are for the other. We cannot uh, see the, this aspect of our being, which we know exists, which we feel in our shame, which we feel uh, when caught under the look of the other. Moreover, we can make an object out of the other. We can situate the other within the world, and we recognize that the other can do this to, to us. The other could see us as an object in a way that we cannot. And 
we recognize from this that an aspect of our being escapes us. Our being is alienated in this way. It is seen from the outside, seen from a perspective unavailable to the for itself. So the other is a look. This look captures me, captures what I cannot capture. The other founds my being in this way. It, it, it is this being which I am, which is unavailable to me, which is made with the freedom, the transcendence of the other. And since I am this being, I lay claim to it. So I'm emphasizing that it is the consciousness of the other, the transcendence of the other, which founds my being for others. The freedom of the other is necessary for me to be. If we think about this in ordinary terms, if I'm to have a reputation or status of any kind, I need the other to confer such qualities on me. So if this aspect of my being, this ontological structure, namely my being for others, is formed or founded by the transcendence of the other, and if I'm to appropriate this being, if I'm to capture my being for others, then I must preserve the freedom of the other. I must assimilate the other's freedom. And this is the second primitive attitude toward the other. The first is to simply make an object out of the other, to fit the other into the world we craft. Sartre describes these as attitudes because, as we will see, we cannot actually appropriate the other's freedom in order to apprehend our objectness or our being for others. To put it in Sartre's term, terms, we cannot surmount the factual negation that separates us. So the struggle to recover my being aims at becoming the foundation of myself in order to be the impossible uh, for itself in itself, in order for my existence to be chosen by my consciousness. That, that is the kind of underlying um, motivation uh, behind the for itself. So my failed attempt to apprehend my being for others by making an object out of the other is the failure of the third ecstasis. Just as a side note, the three ecstasies, reflection, temporality, and being for others, each of these are attempts to step outside of oneself, to see oneself integrated into being. They are attempts at apprehending our being in itself, of closing the gap that is made by that initial internal negation. The failure to apprehend the self that is founded under the look of the other, leads the for itself to the second primitive attitude, towards the project of love. So I must resort to preserving the other's freedom as I incorporate the other into my pursuit. I must assimilate the other and thereby possess my being through the other. I must use the freedom of the other to choose my being. And right there is a hint to how this project fails. If I use the freedom of the other, I fail to preserve it. I, I'm acting for myself. So what is being suggested here is a motivation towards becoming a being that is both itself and other than itself. A being that preserves the for itself while being in itself. And um, this is a godlike being for Sartre. And it's an impossibility. Why is it godlike? It would be a consciousness that permeates through the other and returns on itself, as well as a being that chooses itself in a way that is exactly contrary to our facticity. Remember, we don't choose to be born. We don't choose the family we're born into or our genetic makeup. There's all these th things about life we don't choose. And uh, our facticity, this is our facticity. Our facticity refers us to our contingency or how we are continuous with all of being, how we just fit in seamlessly with everything. Um, and this is precisely the big picture totality that we cannot capture. It's, it's what we cannot apprehend. And it is why we have lack. It is why we cannot completely understand ourselves. To appropriate the other, not as a thing, but as a freedom. That is what we're talking about here. And we attempt to achieve this through love. Sartre writes, if the beloved is transformed into an autonomous, the lover finds himself alone. So falling in love with a robot or a sex doll or some internet character isn't going to do it. We need that freedom to be real. So the lover does not want to possess the beloved as an instrumental object in the world, 
Rather, he wants to be the whole world for the beloved. The lover wants to be the object that the beloved, the other, loses itself in and to, to be the object limit of transcendence, the, ra the raison d'etre. To be the whole world for the other is to be chosen. It is to have my facticity chosen by the freedom of the other of which I incorporate. To apprehend the freedom of the other in the project of love is to have and choose what cannot be chosen. The reciprocity of this means that my freedom is involved in as well. This is why Sartre writes, love is to want to be loved. And Sartre describes this as a failure insofar as it is a reference to infinity. Sartre writes, it is in the capacity of an end already chosen that the lover wishes to be chosen as an end. He continues, I demand of the lover that his free upsurge of his being should have his choice of me as his unique and absolute end. That is, that he should choose to be for the sake of founding my object state and my facticity. Thus, my facticity is saved. It is no longer this unthinkable and insurmountable given which I am fleeing. fleeing. It is that for which the other freely makes himself exist. It is an end which he has given to himself. Sartre goes on to describe the joy of love as feeling that our existence is justified. Before love, our existence is de trop, or not wanted. It's unjustified. It's absurd. It's a protuberance, as Sartre describes it. When, we f when we're in love, we feel that our existence is taken up and willed. And, and this is where the joy comes from. And if we could interior, interiorize this whole system, we would be our own foundation. It's, we would be um, choosing all the aspects that we don't choose about ourselves. Meaning that we would be um, crafting what is given. Our facticity would become like any other project. So love is a project of completing oneself, and seen in these terms, this project results in failure, as it provokes a conflict because the lover and the beloved are acting for themselves in the interests of fulfilling this project. The lover needs to be an object for the beloved to lose himself in. The lover cannot look at the beloved and make him into an object because that would eliminate the freedom of the other. So the, the lover must seduce the other by making himself into a fascinating object. Sartre reminds us that fascination is a consciousness of being nothing in the presence of being, which describes the feeling of being totally absorbed in something. Your consciousness is concentrated on an object of fascination and you lose yourself in these moments. So the lover makes himself into a fascinating object, puts himself under the gaze, under the look of the beloved. The lover appropriates the beloved by means of his objectness. By becoming a fascinating object, the lover becomes uh, an intermediary between the beloved and the world. So you could have the infinity of the world through me, and in this sense, I become unsurpassable. There's no other side to me, in other words. Sartre also discusses language in this section. And if you think about it, language is being for others. Language derives from our capacity to experience ourselves as an object for others. Everything that I do has an outside meaning, which I cannot apprehend. Yet at the same time, I experience an outside meaning to my actions as escaping me. And in this uh, abstract form of language, well, excuse me, this is an abstract form of language. It's broader than just a set of words. Articulated words are um, secondary to what is plainly understood as uh, my being for others, how I am interpreted from the outside. The meaning of my expressions, of my body language, escapes me. I can never know exactly how they are perceived. To become a fascinating object for the other, to seduce the beloved, one must find a fascinating language to be. I'm going to dress a certain way, I'm going to sound a certain way, I'm going to say certain things and act uh, with a certain set of behaviors that are attractive. Um, however, simply becoming a fascinating object is 
insufficient for love. Sartre points out that you could be fascinated by an orator or a tightrope walker, and the necessary reciprocity of love requires the beloved to become the lover. The beloved must project being loved. This is why the consider of lang consideration of language is included in this chapter. So earlier we mentioned that for Sartre, to love is to want to be loved. It, it means the other is choosing. <coughs> to want to be loved is to project. And for Sartre, the issue here is that love relations become a system of indefinite, indefinite reference. The lover needs to see the beloved choosing him and vice versa. And there's a constant need for this. And it's analogous to the reflection reflected of consciousness. This is part of the triple destructibility of love, as Sartre uh, describes it. The, the first is this indefinite reference, as I just mentioned. Um, the second way in which love fails is that the other could always wake up out of love and transcend our transcendence. The beloved could fall out of love and resort to the first primitive attitude of which we simply uh, become an object. And if I'm... if I see the other as an object, I see the other as a means to an end. It's no longer the whole world. Thirdly, there are always other people that can demystify our, our love. Um, love can be made relative by others. So how could I be the whole world for someone if there are others? This is why lovers like to be alone. It's why nobody wants a third wheel and nobody wants to be a third wheel. Um, so let's discuss masochism, which, simply put, is using the other as an instrument to treat you as an object, which is contradictory and results in failure. As, surprise, surprise. This contradiction uh, makes the last part of this section tricky to follow, uh, but we're going to go through it. So the masochist is exaggerating his object state in order to approach it, in order to elicit it to taste it. Sartre writes, even the masochist who pays a woman to whip him is treating her as an instrument and by this very fact posits himself in transcendence in relation to her. So yeah, we have to keep that contradiction in mind. He further elaborates, the, the masochist treats the other as an object and transcend, transcends him toward his own objectivity. It is an attempt to bring out into the open my being for others in the hopes that I could apprehend it, in the hopes that I could shape it so that I could have control over it. However, the objectivity of the masochist escapes him. By seeking his own objectivity, he finds the other's objectivity because he's using the other in a failure to find his own. Now, this seems fairly straightforward. Then Sartre says something interesting. Sartre writes, masochism is an assumption of guilt. I am guilty due to the fact that I am an object, Sartre writes. I'm, I'm guilty toward myself since I consent to my absolute alienation. Now, this guilt exists as um, an admission of being an object in the role of the masochist. Um, this admission requires the subjectivity of the other to participate in the formation of my object state. It is the transcendence of the other that makes me an object. And to be an object is to not be transcendent. So to contrast that with love, where I attempt to become a fascinating object for the other, in masochism, I cause myself to be fascinated by my object state. When we're fascinated by something, we apprehend ourselves as nothing in relation to it. That is the experience of being completely absorbed in something, as I mentioned earlier. For the masochist, that something is me, yet I don't apprehend my objectness, my being for, my, for others, uh, meaning I cannot make an object out of myself. Rather, it is the other's subjectivity, his limitless transcendence of which I cannot access but makes me be. It is to feel this power of the other, as uh, one might feel the edge of a precipice, the potential of completely losing oneself in the transcendence of the other, to approach an edge where I'm completely at will of the other's gaze. The unlimited capacity of the other's subjectivity 
is analogous to a precipice, and Sartre describes masochism as a kind of vertigo. And if we think back to those early chapters um, and the discussion about anguish, anguish at the edge of a precipice, anguish is an emotion about what will I do? How will I respond in this situation? If you're at the edge of a precipice, you could feel how easily you could just decide to jump off. So you feel the power of your situation, of your possibilities. You feel anguish about your potential actions. Anguish is your freedom. So, so this vertigo, before the abyss of the other's subjectivity, as Sartre describes it, is the pot potentiality of submitting oneself to the other's freedom of submitting to how uh, the other sees me in situation, of how he might craft my being according to his pursuit. Yet keep in mind that there is something fake about this, as ultimately I'm using the other. So the more I emphasize my humility, my degradation, the more I submit myself to the other, the closer I get to the edge. And yet I cannot actually leap off. The more I submit myself and affirm myself as under the look of the other, the more I posit myself as a transcendence. The more I craft the situation, the more I use the other. The other is the object. It is my transcendence that operates on him. And the fa false power dynamic uh, simulates the agency of the other as the one who has the power. And um, on the other side of the mask, the sadist we'll get into in uh, my next video, but um, you know, a, a very similar situation exists for the sadist. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll cover that in, in my next video.